right guys and gals let's talk about while loops a while loop executes a block of code as long as its condition remains true it's like an if statement but it will continue that block of code continuously as long as its condition remains true here's an example let's create a program that will ask somebody for their name if they attempt to not type in anything well we'll keep on prompting the user to type in their name the only way for them to escape the while loop is to type in something aka their name so let's create a scanner 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 equals new scanner within the parentheses system.in we'll need an import so be sure to include that at the top import java.util.scanner we'll need a name variable string name equals and we'll just set this to a pair of quotes for now this is how to create a while loop type while then you need a set of parentheses and then a set of curly braces it's kind of like an if statement we'll put our condition within the parentheses if this statement this condition remains true then we will execute this block of code continuously until our condition is no longer true until it evaluates as false this is our condition name dot is blank if somebody attempts to skip the process of entering their name it will keep on prompting the user to type in a name so let's create a print line statement actually i'm going to change this to a print statement enter your name and we will store the result within our name variable name equals scanner dot next line and when we escape the while loop we will display a welcome message hello plus name all right that is it let's try this our program states enter your name i'm not going to type in anything i'm just going to hit enter so you can see it keeps on prompting me to enter my name enter your name no enter your name no this time i'm going to type in my name because i give up enter your name bro therefore our condition is now false because our name is no longer blank and we have exited the while loop and continued on with the rest of our code there is a variation of the while loop it's called a do loop and how we write this is that we move the condition to the end of the block of code and preceding this block of code we write the word do so what makes this different is that with the do loop we will always perform our block of code at least once and then we check the condition after so this will work much the same however we're always performing this block of code at least once so the do loop is a variation of the while loop but it works very similar it always executes the block of code once compared to the while loop it will first check the condition and then execute the block of code if this is true so everybody that is the while loop hey what's going on people let's talk about for loops a for loop executes a block of code a limited amount of times compared to a while loop a while loop could continue infinitely depending if its condition remains true with a for loop this will execute a limited amount of times so before we even begin the for loop we already know how many times that this for loop is going to iterate so let's create a program for an example that will count from 0 to 10. we can do this with a for loop so this is how to create a for loop type in the word for a set of parentheses and then a set of curly braces so with our parentheses we add a condition along with two other statements so there's three parts to this for loop the first part is that we can declare a sort of counter or index so we will declare int index and we can set this equal to zero and then add a semicolon so what a lot of people do is that they shorten index to i it's more shorthand with our second statement this is our condition we would like to continue this for loop as long as i is less than or equal to 10 because we stated that for this program we would like to count from 0 to 10. now this third portion we will increment our counter i by one after each iteration so our for loop at least within the parentheses has three separate statements we declare a counter or index we call it i but it's not necessary that's just a common practice this is our condition we will iterate this for loop as long as this condition is true 
and then we can increment or decrement our index. Let's take a look at this. How many times is this for loop going to iterate? Well, it's going to iterate a total of 11 times because we're counting zero as well. So let's test this. With a print line statement, we will display our index of i. So this will count from zero to 10 and then stop. So let's do the reverse now. Let's start at 10 and count down to zero and then display a message such as Happy New Year. So with our index, let's set this to 10 and change our condition to continue as long as i is greater than or equal to zero. And then with our index, we will decrement this by one. And then when we exit the for loop, let's display happy new year. So we will start at 10, count down to zero and display happy new year. Now with this statement, we could increment this or decrement this by more than one. If we wanted to count down by two, we would write this as I minus equals two. So now this will execute a total of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six times. Another way of writing this for loop that is optional is that you can move this third statement to within the for loop. And this will work much the same as it did before. It's just an optional way of writing this. So that's what a for loop is. It's similar to a while loop, except that it will execute a limited amount of times compared to a while loop that could execute an infinite amount of times. With for loops within the parentheses, there are a total of three statements, an index that you can declare, a condition, and then you can increment or decrement the index by a certain amount. So that is for loops. In this video, I'm going to explain nested loops. A nested loop is really just a loop inside of another loop. To best demonstrate this, let's create a program where we can set a number of rows and columns and display a rectangle of a particular symbol that we decide upon. So in order to create this program, we'll need a scanner. Scanner, scanner equals new scanner. Within the parentheses, we're going to type system.in. We'll need an import. Be sure to include this at the top. Import java.util.scanner. Let's declare a few variables. Int rows, int columns, and a string called symbol depending on the symbol we want to use and for now we'll just set this to a blank set of quotes next let's create a few prompts enter number of rows so we will let the user control the amount of rows that will be displayed and we will store the result within our variable rows rows equals and we need to use our scanner scanner dot next int and let's repeat the process for columns. I will copy everything I have here and change rows to columns. Columns and columns. And we will let the user decide on what symbol they want to display. So within another print line, enter symbol to use. And we will store this within our symbol variable. I guess we could have declared this as a character as well, but it's probably easier if it's a string symbol equals scanner dot next next we'll store our next token that we type until we hit space or enter and then this is where the nested loops comes in we're going to have an outer loop and an inner loop our outer loop is going to be in charge of the rows our inner loop is going to be in charge of the columns so let's begin with the outer loop this will be a for loop for parentheses then a set of curly braces we will add three statements to the for loop. The first is our index, int i for short, short for index, i equals one. Then for our second statement, we're going to continue this for loop as long as i is less than or equal to the amount of rows that we have. And our third statement, we will increment our index of i by one. Within this for loop, all we're going to do is display a print line a blank print line. So this will move our cursor down to the next row to display the next row of characters. So this is where the nested loop comes in. We're going to create another for loop within this for loop. So we will make another for loop for parentheses, curly braces. We'll need an index, but we cannot reuse the same one. 
So let's declare another index, and a common practice for a nested loop is to declare an index of j, because j comes after i in the alphabet, I suppose. So we'll set j to equal 1. That's the first statement. The second statement is that we'll continue this for loop as long as j is less than or equal to the amount of columns that we have. And lastly, we will increment our index of j by 1. Within the nested loop, all we're going to do is display our symbol. Make sure you do this with a print, not a print line statement. So we will print whatever symbol that we have. And that is it. That's it. Let's compile and run this. Enter the number of rows I would like. Four rows and five columns. Which symbol would I like to use? Perhaps the dollar sign. Hit enter. And here is my rectangle. It has four rows. One, two, three, four, and five columns. One, two, three, four, five. So what happened here is that our outer for loop is in charge of the rows. Our inner for loop is in charge of the columns. Once we enter the outer for loop, we're immediately going to add a print line just to move down to the next line. And then with the inner for loop, in order to escape the inner for loop, we need to complete all iterations of the inner for loop. So what we will do during each iteration of this inner for loop is print our symbol. And once we print our symbol, an amount of times equal to the amount of columns that we want, we can escape the inner for loop. And once we complete our inner for loop, we can finish one iteration of our outer for loop, but we have to complete the process all over again for the next iteration of our outer for loop. So we will enter our inner for loop one more time and have to reset our integer j, our index, back to one and repeat the process for the next row all the way until our outer for loop is complete, and then we can exit the program. So that's all what a nested loop is. It's basically any time you have a loop inside of another loop. These don't necessarily have to be for loops. You can have any combination of for loops or while loops for this too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is one example of how a nested loop could be useful, but you may see these in various different types of contexts. And in this video, I'm going to explain arrays. An array is used to store multiple values in a single variable. That is it. They're really not that complicated, but they can seem kind of intimidating. So let's begin with a simple string variable called car. And I will assign this a value of Camaro. What I could do is that I could store multiple values within this single variable by turning this variable into an array. And these are the steps to do so. Next to the data type, I'm going to add a set of straight brackets. And then with the values, I'm going to surround the values with a set of curly braces. And that is it. And for fun, I'll rename this as cars because that makes more sense. So it would make more sense to name this something that is plural because it contains more than one value. So let's add a few other cars. Let's say I would like to add a Corvette and a Tesla. And that is it. That is an array of cars. So in order to access one of these elements, arrays have spots, kind of like parking spots, and they are called elements. So let's say I would like to access this first element. So I'm going to take the name of my array, which is cars, add a set of straight brackets, and then list the element number. So computers always start at zero. If I want to access this first element, I'm going to write zero. And I could reassign this. Let's say I would like to instead place my Mustang within element number zero. And let's print whatever is within the first element of our array of cars. Cars, straight brackets, zero. So this will print my string of Mustang if I want to access the next element. So this is zero, element number zero, and the next one is element one, then two, so on and so forth. In my next element, of my array of cars, we have a Corvette and then a Tesla. So what happens if I attempt to access an element that does not exist? So let's put three here. Well, what we'll get is an array index out of bound exception because this array does not have this element, element number three. It only has elements zero, one, and two. But I could add another element. Let's say I'm going to add a BMW to element number three. 
So then we no longer get that error because our array has a total of four elements, zero, one, two, three. One thing that you should know with arrays, when you assign values, they all have to be the same data type. They have to be consistent. For example, I couldn't add the primitive integer value of one, two, three, because what this states is that this is a type mismatch, cannot convert from int to string. So if you have an array of strings, for example, you can only add strings. If this was an array of integers, well, I could only add integers then to this array. So you have to make sure that the data type of the values that you're adding are all consistent with the data type of the array. Now, there is an additional way to create an array, and that is by first allocating the amount of elements that we'll need and then storing the values later on in the program. So this is an additional way to write an array. We type in the data type of the array, straight brackets, the name of the array, we'll call it cars, equals new, the data type again, straight brackets, semicolon. Within the straight brackets, we'll assign how many elements we would like within this array. Let's say we would like three. So we can assign a total of three strings to our array of cars. And let's do that. So later on in this program, right here's a good spot, we will assign each of the elements of our array of cars. So cars at element number zero will equal my Camaro. And then cars at element one will equal a Corvette. And cars at element two will equal a Tesla. And then we can display each element of this array. So let's begin with cars at zero. This contains the Camaro, then the Corvette, and then the Tesla. So this is an additional way to write an array. We can first declare the amount of elements that we would like for this array, and then we could assign the values later on in the program. Before we finish this video, I'm going to explain how we can use a for loop to iterate through all of the elements of an array. Let's say we would like to display all of the elements of this array. So let's create a for loop to do that. For, a set of parentheses, and then a set of curly braces. With for loops, there are three statements. The first is that we need some sort of index or counter. So let's say int i equals zero. That is the first statement. For the second statement, this is our condition. We'll continue this for loop as long as i is less than r array cars dot length. And lastly, we will increment our index by one. So let's display whatever is within our array of cars at element number i. So i is going to begin at zero, then after each iteration of this for loop, it's going to increment by one. So when we run this, this will display all of the elements of our array of cars, Camaro, Corvette, and Tesla. All right, everybody, so that's what an array is. It's really just used to store multiple values within a single variable. If you need to access one of the elements of an array, you just list the name of the array and the element number in which you're trying to access. All right, everybody, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be explaining 2D arrays. A 2D array is an array of arrays. Think of a 2D array as having a number of rows and columns. That's how I think of it, at least. We're going to be assigning some cars, some car names, into each element of our 2D array. Think of it like a parking lot, and each element has a row and column, kind of like a parking spot number. So to begin, let's declare a 2D array and allocate some memory. So the data type will be string. Then for a 2D array, we need two sets of straight brackets this time. And then the name of the array, we will call this cars equals new, the data type again, which is string, two sets of straight brackets. And then we will list the amount of rows and columns. So let's say this will be three by three, three arrays, and each array is going to have three elements. So let's begin assigning some cars into our 2D array. Let's begin with row zero. So in order to access a certain element of our array, we type in the array name, and this time we will add two sets of straight braces. We would like to access element zero, zero. So this is row zero, column zero, equals, and let's assign a name of Camaro. Now we would like to access row zero, column one. 
and let's assign a different car, maybe a Corvette. Cars at row zero, index two, will equal maybe a Silverado. All right, we're going to move to row one now. Actually, I'm just going to copy what we have here, paste it. So we are now on row one, column zero. And let's assign a different car, maybe a Mustang. And let's repeat the process. Just to speed this up, I'm going to do a little bit of copying and pasting. So we're within row one, and then we have column zero, one, and two. And let's change some of these names. For row one, column one, I will assign a value of Ranger. And row one, column two, maybe F150. Okay, so we are now within row two, column zero. So I'm going to copy that, change some of the values. Row two, column zero, I will assign a value of Ferrari. We are now on row two, column one, I will assign a value of maybe Lambo for Lamborghini. And then lastly, row two, column two, and I will place a Tesla in this element. And there we have it. We have assigned all of the values within our 2D array. So let's display all of the elements of our 2D array using a nested for loop. So we will have a outer for loop in charge of the rows and an inner for loop in charge of the columns. So let's create a nested for loop. So this is the outer for loop. We'll need an index. Int, we'll call it i for index, equals zero. And then we will continue this for loop as long as i is less than cars dot length. And lastly, we will increment our counter, our index i by one. Within the for loop, let's add a blank print line just so that we move our cursor down to the next row within the console window when we display each row of cars that we have. Now we need an inner for loop to display each column, each element within each column of our 2D array. So we'll need an index. Let's call this int j because j comes after i. Set this equal to zero. That's the first statement. Our condition is going to look a little funky. We'll continue this inner for loop as long as j is less than cars at index i dot length. So this will take the length of our first row and we'll continue our counter, our index of j, as long as it's less than the length of our row that we're currently on. And then we will increment our index j by one. Within the inner for loop, all we'll do is print our array of cars at element i for this first set of straight brackets and j. Cars at row i, column j. And then maybe I'll add a space just to separate these. And what we get here is that this will display our 2D array of cars that we have. Now there is an additional way to write this 2D array. Instead of allocating all of the memory for this 2D array, what we could have done is assign all of the values right away to this 2D array when we declared it. If you prefer to write it that way, this is what will change. Instead of allocating all of the space, all of the elements that we would like for this 2D array, we're instead going to assign all of the values. So let's get rid of this portion, and we're first going to assign all of the values within row number zero. This is our first array. So within our set of curly braces, we will add our Camaro, followed by our Corvette, and lastly, our Silverado. So this is row one, it's its own array. We will add a second array for row number one. The first row was row number zero. So in our second array of row one, we have our Mustang, followed by our Ranger, and lastly, our F-150. Okay, that is array number two, also known as row one. We are now on row two. So let's add another array. And we have our Ferrari, followed by our Lambo. And lastly, our Tesla. 
All right, and then with all of this, I'm going to enclose all of these arrays within another set of curly braces. Then I'll need to add a semicolon to the end. And just so that this is easier to read, I'm going to separate each array within a new line. So it should look something like this. Eh, that's good enough. Sorry, I'm very particular about the appearance. Okay, so this is our 2D array of cars that we have. And you can see that it will work much the same even if I remove all of these lines of code. The only difference is that we're assigning all of the values to our 2D array when we declare it. All right, everybody, so that is the basics of 2D arrays. It's really just an array of arrays. Think of it as having rows and columns. I hope you find out this video useful. If you like it, then press the like button. Share it with your friends or anyone who wants to make his career in Java. Do you have any suggestions regarding the content? Comment section is all yours. This is the seventh part of this series. For more parts from this series, subscribe our channel and hit the bell icon. Thanks for watching.